Welcome to Christ Church. It is so good to see you this weekend. It's so fun watching people every week say yes to Jesus and give their life to him through baptism. Maybe that's a, a step of faith that you need to take. And if that's you, I want to make the pathway incredibly clear. It's real simple. You can go out to our welcome area at the end of our time together. You can download the Christ Church app on your phone. If you don't have the Christ Church app, you can scan the QR code on the seat back near you. It'll prompt you to do everything that you need to do. Hit the next step tab, begin the conversation. And while you're on the app, there's a place to check in. We ask people to do that every weekend and also a place at the bottom portion of your screen to submit a prayer request. Well, this weekend across both campuses, we're closing the series that we've been in for the last three weeks that we're calling Balancing Life's Demands. In week one, we talked about what it looks like to, to keep going in week two, we talked about speed and how, how do we balance the speed in which we live life. And this weekend, we're closing the series talking about work. Some of you, I could feel the energy leave the room, all right? <laughs> this weekend, we're talking about work. And I want to start by kind of framing the conversation like this. Recently, I found an article by a Texas A&M professor named Anthony Klautz. He wrote an article, and he coined the phrase, the Great Resignation. He was playing off the wording of the Great Depression, and he points out in this article that Americans are quitting their job, they're, they're leaving, they're resigning their job from their job at an incredible rate. He goes on to say that one in five will likely change jobs in the next 12 months. He said in the article, 35% of Americans would say that they're not happy with what they're being paid, he says that Gen Z is the most anxious when it comes to work because they're concerned about being replaced in their jobs by technology. But what if I told you that that's not only true in the marketplace, this anxiety, but it's also true with church leaders. Pastors are thinking about quitting their job at an incredible rate. Recently, Barna, Barna released an article that said two out of five pastors are considering quitting ministry in the next 12 months. That's 41% of pastors, at pastors asking the question that so many of you are asking. Should I quit my job? Now, to be clear, I'm not going to try to answer that question for you this weekend. But I think what's true about all of us is that we, we would all agree that what's happened in our world over the course of the last four years has drastically changed the way we work and the way we think and approach our work. For many of you, 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 you left the building and now you work remotely. For some of you, you're now being called back to a physical building to work again and you, you, don't, you don't like it. For the rest of you, you, you never left the physical building and you think people who work from home don't actually work. It's another conversation for others of you, you're in this place where you're, you're trying to hire people, and you, you can't find anyone to hire. You can't find anyone who is willing to do the work because the way we work and how we work is changing. But I think we would all agree that at our core, we understand that our work is important. Our, our, our work, it, it pays for how we live, it pays for our food, it pays for our necessities, it provides and it pays for our bills. But here's the question that I can answer this weekend, and it's this question. How does Jesus change the way we work? How does our relationship with Jesus change how we go to work tomorrow morning? The Bible answers the question for us. See, what if I told you that God's word has a lot to say about work? In fact, you don't have to look very far to, to find it on the pages of your Bible. In Genesis 1, we see the story of creation. On, on day 6, God begins to set into motion the creation of mankind. He rests on day 7, and then he breathes life into Adam. Adam becomes a living, breathing being, and then what God does is he places Adam in, in the garden. And when he places Adam in the garden, here's what he does. He gives him a task. He gives him a job to do. He gives him work. Because here's what Genesis 2.15 says. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to what? Work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, 
You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Here's what I want you to notice as we begin this conversation about work. Work comes before the fall. Work, it comes be before sin enters into, enters into the part of the human story and condition. Work isn't the curse. And so, why do we treat it like it's a curse? Why do so many of us treat work like it's a bad thing? Why do we treat it like a punishment? Why is it in our minds often associated with something that's negative? To notice that in, in Genesis, God works, and if God works, then why do we think we are above the work? Wor work from the beginning has never been meant to be a punishment. Work has always been meant to bring purpose. So what do you do? If, if the place you spend 40 plus hours a week feels more like a punishment and not purposeful, what do you do if you, you work with a bunch of people who they're really hard to work with? The, the way they talk, the way they act, the way they treat one another. What do you do if your boss is more concerned with the bottom line than he is you? What, what if you catch your supervisor speaking negatively about someone you work with or maybe even speaking negatively about you? Well, what if you're looking at your work and you're hearing the word purpose this morning and you're like, Matt, you just don't get it. Like work and purpose, they don't, they don't connect for me. One of the, the best things that my parents ever did was allow me to get a job at such a, a young age. I got my, my first job when I was 13. That job came because on my 13th birthday, I was getting ready to blow out the candles, and my dad was like, hey, son, you want a car in three years? And I was like, yep. And he goes, cool, get a job. <laughs> so he let me get a job that summer when I was 13. My job was to uh, work for the park district. I, I was supposed to take care of all the baseball fields and all the preparation that allowed games to happen in the evening. That's what I did in the summer. And in the winter, I worked for my parents at their machine shop. And it was that job in the winter that really changed the way that I work. One day we were driving home from work. I was driving with my dad. Uh, mostly I was driving with him because I didn't want to walk. I was like 14, okay? And so we're in the truck on the way home, and I don't know if he saw something in me that he wanted to correct. I, I don't know if he used it as an opportunity to use it as a teachable moment and to try to reassess the way I think about work. But he, he said to me that day, son, you need, you need a mind shift change when it comes to work. He said, you need to start seeing work like mission. He said, the first thing you need to do is this. You, you need to start seeing people that you work with like Jesus would. You, you, you need to understand that for the majority of these people that you work with, they, they have very little hope. They don't have hope in Jesus for the majority of them. And so they struggle. He said, you need to see them like Jesus would. The second thing he said is, you need to act like Jesus. If you're going to see them like Jesus, you need to act like Jesus, and you need to understand they are looking at the way you work. They are looking at the way you treat other people. They're looking at your, your work ethic. They're looking at you. Be an example. Be like Jesus. See them like Jesus. Act like Jesus. And third, I think he added this one because he owned the company, but he said, you need to start looking at your workplace like you're an owner. He said, never, ever walk past a piece of trash. Do you know how much trash is in a machine shop? There is a ton of trash in a machine shop. There is. He said to me, son, if you can do those three things, here's what will happen. You, you will change the way you work. See, here's what I learned in that single cab blue F-150 on the way home from work that day. If I can do those three things, work and mission connect. If I can do those three things, 
how I work and who I work for ultimately change. See, not, not only does Genesis remind us that work isn't the curse, the Apostle Paul shows us how that's lived out in everyday life. I think he shows us best in a place called Colossians chapter 3. And what's interesting to me about this section of Scripture and how Paul begins this section is it's so connected to what Genesis 1.27 says. That, that we are made in the image of God. That we are God's first. Here's what he says as he starts Colossians chapter 3. He says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Say your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. Notice brand new identity. You are Christ and you're his alone. New identity leads to new purpose. He continues to verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, it's important, appears. Then you will also appear with him in Glory. He's saying, hey, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, it is alive in you. His power, it's what changes you. His power is what has raised you to a new life in him. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. And the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, here's what Paul is trying to get us to understand. He's saying, hey, Christ, he is your life. And, and if he is your life, here's what you need to know. He transforms your life. It's a picture of Christ doing what only Christ can do. He's changing you. He changes everything about you, including what he's about ready to say next as we continue reading Colossians chapter 3. But when the Apostle Paul begins to address the relationship that employees have with their employers. He says in, in verse 22 of Colossians 3, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. It's important for you to know that when Paul pins this letter, he, he writes this letter from prison. He's in prison and he picks up the pen and he says, Slaves... Obey your earthly master in everything and do it not only when their eyes are on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, but there is no favoritism. Chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Now, depending on what translation you, you may be reading, the very first word in chapter 22 for you might be the word bondservant. A bondservant is actually a slave. The difficulty about this word for you and me is when we hear the word slave, we, we think of something different. The culture that Paul is writing to and our culture is, is different. When Paul is writing this letter, nearly half of the Roman Empire are slaves. And slavery during the day of Paul, it looks something like this. Men would willfully sell their lives, their everything, into slavery. They, they had to provide for their family. They had to provide for the necessities that it took to live. And for many of them, they worked their way out of slavery, but many of them did not. They, they remained slaves for their entire lives so that they could afford to live. Slavery was, simply put, their job. These, these people are, are living in a culture where it's incredibly difficult to provide for their families. And Paul is using this as a way to show his original audience, hey, Jesus changes everything about you, including how you work. In fact, I, I think what's incredibly important about this section is that Paul actually answers the question for us, how does Jesus change the way I work? 
How does my relationship with Jesus change my workplace? He shows us. In fact, he's going to show us that when Jesus is your life, when Jesus changes you, here's what happens. Your work will become worship. Notice that in, in verse 22, he uses some specific language. He says, with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. He, he's reminding us, hey, that this is for the Lord. And he continues in verse 23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as, as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Again, for the Lord. Verse 24, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Verse 1 of chapter 4, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Five times in five verses, he's referencing and making sure it's clear that we work for the Lord. And if we work for the Lord, here's what that means. Whatever you do, wherever you work, whatever your job is, whether you get a paycheck or whether you don't, do it in a way where you are actually serving God. Because that is how your work becomes worship. Whether you're a police officer, a teacher, a farmer, a welder, a construction worker, a counselor, an office manager, or a stay-at-home mom, do whatever you do and do it in a way that honors and glorifies God. Do it that way. The difficulty is that we live in a world that doesn't approach work like that. This past week, I ran across an article that was released in the spring of 2023. It was a Gallup poll, and the article's title was this, Is Quiet Quitting Real? There is this trend in the American workforce called quiet quitting. The article went on to say that it all stems from what happened in 2020, where people are now reevaluating what is important in their lives. People are starting to ask the question how much does my job actually matter? Is my job actually important? And the result, according to the data, is shocking. The, the, the results are saying that over 50% of Americans are quietly quitting their jobs. What does that mean? It means they haven't quit their job because they need to get paid. It just means that they've quit doing the extra. They, they have quit being the solution to the problem in the organization. They, they have quit doing anything extra when it comes to their job. They're trying to stay home more and work less. They're trying to work remote and not in an office. They're trying to do as little as they can. And here's why. Because they're seeing their job and they're feeling a sense of meaningless. They're, they're, they're driving home every, every day and they're, they're thinking to themselves, does this actually matter? Understand, I'm not trying to say that those questions that people are asking are bad questions. I am in no way saying that you should prioritize work over your family. I, I understand that if you're not careful, work can become what you worship. And we're talking about work becoming worship, two different conversations. But what I'm saying is that for so many of us, I think we are missing out on a sense of purpose that only Jesus can give us. Because when Jesus lives in you, here's what it does. It makes everything you do, no matter what it is, an opportunity to worship and glorify him. So what's that look like? How does swinging a hammer, teaching a classroom of kids, Pulling someone over for speeding on the interstate. Okay, I don't know how that's worship, all right? But <laughs> how, how does what we do every day become worship to God? Well, I think Paul laid it out for us pretty clearly. Remember how he began in verse 22? 
He began to talk about it like this. Slaves, obey your earthly master in everything and do it. So how, how does work become worship? It becomes worship when you're obedient. See, n- notice that the application for us, it's not complicated. It's not, it's not hard to understand. The application is, hey, Christian employees, obey your boss. Let me break it down in everyday language for you. Christian employee, do what your boss says to do. Your job, this is revolutionary, is to simply do your job. As followers of Christ, we are called to make our lives worship. And if our lives are worship, here's what that means. Our jobs are an opportunity for worship. So understand, it honors God. When you honor the authority that God has placed in your life. And listen how he says to do it. He says, not only when their eyes are on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. He literally says, hey, don't just do your job when your boss is around. Instead, do it with a sincerity of heart. He's talking about doing our job with a sense of integrity. He's saying, do do your job when your boss is standing next to you. And and do your job when he isn't next to you. Because ultimately, that's integrity. That's what it looks like to do your job and to do it well. And so let let me try to make this as practical as I can for us. If your boss says that it is your job to scroll social media, then by all means, watch as many TikTok videos as you can, okay? But if it's not your job to scroll social media, stop it and do your job. If your boss says that it's your job to shop on Amazon all day, then then by all means, like, get Amazon Prime and get the two-day shipping, all right? But if it's not your job to shop on Amazon then stop it and do your job. If it's your job to to walk around and distract everyone that you work with by conversations that have nothing to do with work, then by all means, get a good pair of tennis shoes, get something that will count your steps, and get your steps in. All right? But if it's not your job, stop it and do your job. If it's your job to sweep floors, to cut grass, to lay brick, to build buildings. The application of the Bible, the application of God's word is to do what your boss says to do, to do it in a way that honors and glorifies God. Do it that way. One of the greatest lessons that I learned in my life is to never approach my job like I'm irreplaceable. I've learned throughout the last 20 years of work that if I'll approach my job like I'm replaceable, it changes the way I work. I've also learned that I should never approach my job, whatever I'm doing, like I deserve the paycheck that I get every week. Because if we're not careful and we approach our job like we're irreplaceable, or we approach our job like we deserve what we're getting paid, here's what happens. Entitlement is what comes. And if you approach your work like you're entitled, here's what happens. It will never lead you down a path of worship. Entitlement doesn't lead to worship. It just doesn't. Now, I understand that there are, there are some of you who are like me. And you get this incredible opportunity to build relationships with the people you work with. And so the, the casual conversation, it's okay. Checking your phone from time to time, that according to your boss, is is okay, and that's fine. But here's what I'm saying. If those things are keeping you away from doing your job and doing it well, then we should stop it. Because if you're getting paid not to do your job, then you're being lazy. And laziness, according to God's word, it does not honor God. I mean, he's totally changing the way we approach work. He says at the end of verse 22, do our job with reverence for the Lord. Understand, the reason we obey our boss is ultimately because we have a master in heaven whose name is Jesus. 
We, we obey Jesus. We listen to Jesus. Jesus has ultimate authority in our life. And so based on how our culture is living and operating, I think I have to address this. If your boss tells you to do something that dishonors God or goes against God's word, then you had better listen to God and not your boss, even if that means you lose your job. God's word has the ultimate authority in our life. God's word tells us what we can and cannot do. End of story. Can I just tell you, like, it is getting harder and harder, I know, for so many of you to be a Christ follower in our culture. It's getting harder and harder to do your job, depending where you work, as a follower of Jesus. It will be harder tomorrow than it was on Friday. But understand, our, our call as people who say we are followers of Jesus, we follow him and his word as the ultimate authority in our life. That is how we make our work worship. He has ultimate authority in our life over everything that we do. The application is we do what our boss says because God's word says so. But if your boss says to you to do something that doesn't line up with God's word, we listen to God because we follow God. We follow his word. See, not, not only does work become worship when we obey, he continues on and says that work becomes worship when we work with our whole heart. He says in verse 23, whatever you do, work at it as you are work, work, work at it with all your heart. As working for the Lord, not for human masters. But Paul is, is saying when you work, you should work at it with all of your soul. You should put everything that you have into your work, whatever it is you're doing. And so, what would it look like if you stopped working for your boss and started working for the Lord? Maybe you're here today and your job is to cut grass. What would it look like if you cut grass like you were cutting Jesus' yard? Maybe you're here today and your job is to build buildings. What would it look like if you built that building like you were building a house for God? What would it look like if you are a farmer and you farmed like you were farming for God? What would it look like if you're a teacher and you taught like Jesus would teach? What if you're a roofer and you, you acted as if you were putting a roof on Jesus' house? How would it change the way you work if, if you worked like you were working for Jesus? Paul is saying this, that you and I should work like that. Because when we work like that, our work becomes worship. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. He says that work becomes worship when we first obey. Work becomes worship when we work at it with all of our heart. And then third, he says, work becomes work worship when we see every day like there's a payday that's coming. In verse 24, he says, Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. When I was a kid, I mentioned I got my first job when I was 13. And here's what that summer looked like. I would get dropped off early before my dad headed to work at the park district, and I would start when no one else was there. I'd start working, and I'd work all day long till about 4 o'clock. He'd pick me up. I'd go home. I'd eat some food, and then I would go back to the park, and I would umpire Little League baseball games till about 10 or 10.30 at night. It was tiring. It was exhausting. Uh, this is the time before cell phones, so I was not getting text messages from my friends telling me all the things that I was missing out on, but I was missing out on a lot. And I felt that way until the first Friday came. And I got a paycheck. And I'm like, that's right. All my friends are poor and I'm not. Deal with it. <laughs> and here's what I learned that summer. That Friday was a really good motivator. Payday was a really good motivator. And what Paul is saying here in verse 24 is that there, there is more than one kind of payday. 
He's saying that there is coming a day where Jesus himself is going to reward you for all the work that you have done. It is going to help you understand that you're working for an inheritance that will come. Now understand, he's not talking about salvation being earned. That's not what he's trying to communicate. He's saying salvation includes an eternal reward that comes through Jesus and what he has done for us on a cross and in an empty tomb. See, Paul is telling us, the Bible is saying, work in a way like every day is like payday. Work in a way where you know that there is an eternal reward that is coming. And it's not going to be financial. It's going to be better than that. It is going to be eternal. That changes the way we work. If you remember last week, I ended the message by challenging you to be a part of a 15-minute challenge. The challenge was to find a seat and to just simply sit down. How you doing with that? I figured if I challenged you to do it, then I should probably do it too. <laughs> I made it most days, not every day. But on Wednesday, I was sitting down in the evening and kind of just taking my 15 minutes. And as I was sitting there, I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke and told me how to finish this message. And I just ignored it (laughs) until Thursday. And then I felt like he was saying it again. See, for me, when I think about work, I I can't think about work or talk about work without thinking about my dad. My dad taught me how to work. And and more than that, he he showed me how to work. Yesterday uh, was the 11-month mark of him being gone. And... I want to close today by telling you a story. And for some of you, you've heard this story. And if you've heard this story, you need to hear it again. Because I did too. For others of you, you, you've never heard this story. But this story will change the way you think about work. My dad passed on a, a Saturday evening. It was unexpected. We didn't see it coming. And on Thursday, uh, my wife Megan and I, we, we drove to St. Louis where he worked and where he managed the company, and we, we cleaned out his office. We're, we're going through his desk, and he had a, a jar full of, like a drawer full of snacks, you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, okay, awesome. Uh, I don't know what this is about. We walk into the building, and he managed a metal pouring facility where they would heat up metal at an incredible high temperature. They would pour it, and they would make these cast aluminum pieces. And if you've ever worked in a factory or you've ever worked around those type of people, it is a really hard place to work. There's not a lot of Jesus on the floor. They're cleaning out his office, and a guy named Mark walks in and says, Matt, before you leave, can you swing into my office? I said, sure. So we pack up all the boxes, we take them to our car, and we we go and we sit down. And he's fighting back the tears. I'm fighting them back too. And he says, you know, Matt, when I had a question about Scripture, I would go to your dad. And no matter what he was doing, he would take a minute and he would explain it to me the best he knew how. The last week of my dad's life, we had a couple conversations, and one of the questions that he was always asking was, did I miss my calling? He would ask me all the time, like, should I have been a pastor? I felt like God made me to be a pastor, and I I neglected it. I should have done that. I should have done this. 
And that week I just listened and I'm like, man, you're 62 years old, like, and you're still questioning. <laughs> and then Mark said something to me that day. He said, Matt, not only did this place lose their manager, but this place lost their pastor. If I could go back and tell him one thing, I would tell him this. Dad, you were a pastor. And you pastored in the best way. Not on a stage in front of a bunch of people listening to you. You pastored by the way you lived. You pastored where you worked. You pastored by the way you spoke and the way you taught people and the way you cared deeply about them. My question for all of us, my question for me is this. Are you seeing your workplace like you're the pastor? When you walk into work tomorrow, are you walking in going, I'm the pastor of this place. The way that I speak, the way I care, the way I act, it is a reflection of Jesus in me. When you go to school tomorrow, if you're a student, are you, are you treating your school like you're the pastor? Dads, are you looking at your kids and are you thinking to yourselves, I'm the pastor of this house. The way you think and the way you act, it matters. And what God's word is telling us is that we can take our work, what we do, 40 plus hours a week, and we can turn it into something that honors and glorifies God. It can be worship. But will you live it out? Will you treat your work like it's worship? Father, I am so thankful for every person in this room and for what they do all week long. And God, my prayer is that as they walk into work tomorrow, they would see where they work differently. That the way they treat people and the way they act and the way they work would be transformed because of you. Christ, who is our life. You're our life. You've changed us. You've redeemed us. You've changed everything about us. And my prayer, God, is that people would notice it and they would see it. Father, I pray that our relationship with you would be shown by the way we act and the way we live. Father, may we treat our work like it's worship to you. Father, it is in the name of Jesus that we pray together.